Okay, now we start 17, the last of the core lectures in the radar course. And it's going to be on transmitters and receivers. Will be, that will be the topics. And finally, we're back for the last time that I'll be showing it to you, this bl generic block diagram of the radar. And this lecture will cover all of the subsystems that you see within the red dashed box, the receiver, the transmitter, which will have a waveform generator, the power amplifier or power amplifiers that could be a, a train building up in power, uh, depending upon the system and uh, how the transmitter is configured, and then the old transmit receive switch, which will make sure that the receiver doesn't get fried while the, uh, you're transmitting a pulse of radar energy out to the target. Now let's going back to the radar equation. Here are the trans uh, here are the parameters that are affected by the transmitter and receiver. Here's the signal to noise ratio depending linearly on the average power. This is the search form of the radar equation. The aperture, the scan time within the solid angle you're looking at, cross section, and down below the system temperature of which when we looked over it in detail in the radar range equation, there are a number of uh, issues such as uh, uh, the loss in the receiver the, uh, and, and other system losses that would be, depend on the transmitter, the waveguides. And, uh, and the thing you obviously want to do is the signal to noise ratio can be enhanced by higher power in the tr average power in the transmitter, lower system losses both on transmit and receive, and we want to minimize the system temperature. And the design of the radar transmitter receiver subsections affect these three parameters directly. So now we're going to go over and we're going to look at transmitters, receivers, and it really isn't all that simple because architecture issues of the radars and uh, solid state, uh, sets of solid state transmitters versus a one large power amplifier tube with a small intermediate power amplifier. This is going to be a lot of stuff we're going to go through. But the first element we're going to look at are the transmitters overall. And here's that part of the outline broken down into a number of sections. And we're going to go through uh, in these first, uh, this first of I think we'll have five sub pieces, um, digestible I call them, remember, uh, of this lecture will be one that will include the introduction, the block diagram, which we've already done. And we're going to talk about high to high power tube amplifiers and we're going to go down through the cross field amplifier and we'll compare and take a look at these and then we'll go in and we'll move our way down the list till finally we summarize. This is long, a long lecture it has a total of 86 view graphs in the entire lecture. Okay, so it's an introduction. Well, what do we really want in terms of the ideal transmitter? We want it to provide sufficient energy to detect the target. We want it to be just readily modulate, to, to be able to readily modulate uh, the, the, the input pulse so that we can, um, uh, we want it, the, the transmitter itself to be very easily modulated so we can produce the rec desired waveforms. Uh, we want a very stable, noise-free signal for the clutter rejection. That means we want a pure transmitted signal transmitted out with very low frequency side lobes. We need tunable bandwidth, uh, either in a small change or instantaneous, depending upon the system use. High efficiency and reliability. We want it to be maintainable, have a long life, and we want it to be small and lightweight for the intended application. And also we want it affordable, excuse me, we want it affordable. And as I read down the list, 
the list here, uh, it, it, it gets to be more contradictory that you ever could build anything that uh, would be ideal. So there are going to be a lot of compromises necessary to build the right transmitter for the right radar to meet it, the requirements for a specific mission. So a lot of compromise and trade-offs are going to be made to, to, to make this, uh, to have the right level of compromise in each of these uh, different areas so that we meet the mission requirement of the radar. Now here's a simplified block diagram of the radar transmitter uh, section. And we've left out the signal processor like that. We're going to, first of all, have a waveform generator. And this is a, a generator which outputs from milliwatts to a watt or so. And it will generate very precisely and accurately on the frequency you want with the right waveform the and, and stability, the the modulation that you want on your on your transmitter and then we go to a, a high power transmit sections and you see first of all uh, I've toned this towards large dishes and you see an obvious inconsistency the, um, the high power transmitter sections I say generally go from around 100 watts to uh, um, in the megawatt region. And I have this high power amplifier, just one amplifier. But the truth is, is that you'll have a waveform generator and you could have, instead of the, just one amplifier, a series of amplifiers. And when this one watt isn't enough to give you the input you need into your high power amplifier, there'll be an IPA, an intermediate power amplifier, that will give you enough power to input into your high power amplifier and bring it up into the hundreds of watts or so that you'd need to feed a high, one high powered transmitter tube, say. Uh, or you could have uh, the waveform generator feeding a lot of small st solid state transmit receive modules that would uh, come together in series and build up so that you had output many megawatts, but they would be a very large number of uh, transmit modules or transmit receive modules, you'll see later, on the phased array antenna. But the point is, is we've got this low power section and we've got to build up to a high power section. And not all transmitters will have an intermediate power amplifier. Most of the high power tubes won't do. And, uh, and a lot of times there's, there are multiple inputs from the waveform generator into many, many transmitters you'll see when we get over into the architecture part. And then the second part, when we get the received signal back, we filter it, of course, both in the transmit section and when it comes back on receive so that we're just receiving the bandwidth that we're interested in. And then we'll have a low noise amplifier because we want to keep the, the noise as low as possible going into the receiver. And the receiving section coming in will have signals from the micro to, to milliwatts size for very long range radars um, that that'll be the case so you want um, and then you're going to go to the A to D converters right after the receiver but I'm going to show you um, even variances to that towards the end and then we go on to the signal processor so we can divide the transmitter and the receiver into two major subsystems uh, the low power transmit and low power receive sections and where we have the waveform generator and the receiver and a high power transmit section with somewhere in here we have to make uh, a continuity in these powers and many systems will have an intermediate power amplifier either packed into the IPA 
or just after the waveform generator. Um, it'll be depend on how the system architects divide it up and where it would go, that sort of thing. Now, here is a generic block diagram of a high power tube transmitter. Okay? And w we divided it up into two sections a high voltage section, and I mean these very high voltages and very high currents, and, uh, and then a pulse modulator that will turn on the modulation and it will be amplified from an RF intermediate power amplifier in the microwave network and that modulator will turn it on and off and a high power tube amplifier with a solenoid and we're going to look at through a number of different kinds of power amplifiers and then we'll go out now uh, to, to the antenna you see there's a crowbar unit well I'm going to go over these two areas in detail and what they are and how they work when we talk about major subsystems in the transmit receive uh, in the transmitter in a later part of one of the other sections now I don't know about you but one of the first things I ever made in my life was a lot I don't know about you but one of the first things that I ever made that was electrical or electronic in nature was a power supply for an amateur radio transmitter and basically, uh, this is the same block diagram almost, just about. Okay? Uh, what you've got is uh, primary power coming in, which would be the AC line. You've got uh, a system, uh, an SCR controller, um, a, a silicon control rec controlled rectifier that uh, protects the transmitter. And then you've got a high voltage supply, and that is in essence a transformer that steps up the incoming voltage and very high current into a very high voltage with less current per unit time. It's the same energy coming in. It's the, 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 it's the same average. But, and then you go through a capacitor regulator bank. Before I do that, the, the, what the rectifier does is it just takes your AC and it flips the negatives up, the negative portions of the AC up into the DC region, the positive region of voltage, and this rectifier uh, turns the alternating current into direct current. And we have a capacitor bank and regulator to store that current till we want to transmit it. And this crowbar unit you'll see is a safety unit so that you don't destroy things when you get an arc in the, in the power tube. But anyway, you've got primary power coming in and you're taking, say, uh, 600 watts, excuse me, you're taking 600 volts at, at many tens or, you know, uh, uh, of amps and not enough to give you uh, a power out say this is a 30%, uh, 20%, uh, uh, you know, uh, you'd have a, uh, you know, a huge amount of power is coming in this primary source, uh, the order of uh, hundreds of kilowatts or, you know, a megawatt. You might, ha you might have a, a generator for, for this that was a megawatt generator. Uh, excuse me. You'd have for this a generator that had uh, an average power easily of a couple of hundred kilowatts for a, for a high power system. And it's all going to depend on how far you have to reach out. And you'll see the size of these can, can be huge in size, I'm going to point out to you, in the uh, millstone radar. Okay? And then there are going to be others where uh, the prime power coming in, it's all on a microchip in monolithic uh, gallium arsenide, all integrated. So, but the point is, primary power comes in at a certain amperage, it's, and it's alternating current, and it goes through a process where you make a DC current 
before it goes in here. Now then we have other sections down below that are these four are all ones that where you automatically keep an eye on things because if you have a problem in your transmitter uh, th things can go expensive and catastrophic very fast in terms of money if something breaks so you have to have a transmitter console that would control all the input for transmitter control and protection uh, and, and, and have control into all these different places and so here the transmitter functions would be handled in this box you have fault isolation all over the place where you'd have different voltages have to be within certain ranges or you want to shut the system down and you want to have an antenna protection system which tells you if the tubes are arcing to implement the crowbar unit which will um, I'll explain that in a little bit before you go out and deal with transmit your high power and the RF input would be coming from your microwave uh, with your waveform generator through a microwave network and your RF intermediate power amplifier for the configuration of a very large dish uh, space track system and it, as I said we're talking high power tube transmitters now I'd like to look at some a bunch of the different architectures where you actually get those kinds of uh, a power excuse me uh, the first is the klystron and this was the first developed and what you do uh, this is the, this was developed um, uh, back in the late 30s for other uses uh, and was used much later when the sophistication of building klystorons um, got to be much better in the 50s is where it came into its own in radar. Its bandwidth can be as great as 12 percent and the RF conversion efficiency is 35 to 50 percent. So you can convert from the RF coming in to the RF coming out with this amplifier that kind of efficiency and that's really good and what's most important about this is it's going to be coherent from pulse to pulse when we do integration now let's look at the architecture we have a heater here which is uh, put voltage through and it'll e emit ions and this will be the cathode of the tube and will modulate the anode so that you have bunches of electrons that will come down this path and this is these are RF cavities and it will go into a collector and the RF will come in at the first one and then there'll be a drift space and out at the last and I believe the next view graph tells you how that works in general not just in a sentence or two and I've taken out pointing the different things here uh, these are so uh, they produce an awful lot of x-rays and you need a lot of shielding to um, to implement them the RF section is composed of a number of these resonant uh, sections called ca resonant cavities as I said the RFs coupled in through a slot in the cavity and it goes out to a, another slot, either a, a cavity, a coax, or will go out to a um, waveguide. And the resonant frequency of the cavities is identical to the RF input frequency, and causing cavities to oscillate. And this oscillation of the electric field modulates the speed of the electron beams into bunches. So the electrons are going to go faster and faster and so that this resonant cavity at the output extracts the RF power from the resonating, from the, excuse me, extracts the density modulated beam and delivers the power to the output transmission line. That, that's how klystorons work. Here's an example of, of what one is. 
Uh, I should have had a one foot scale. This one is at S band. Um, it's used in weather radars and air surveillance. It's built by uh, CPI, and we give thanks to CPI. Um, and here is the that that long tube, and and here there's an input section and an output section. And if it, uh, if this this would be lambda rho, this would be five centimeters, because the waveguide's about lambda rho over two, and it's tunable. It can deliver a peak power output of uh, two megawatts, and the average power of, the, of that pulse going out can be uh, it, it, it can be up to three kilowatts, and that's a five a fifty dB gain that you can get with this kind of a high power amplifier, and do it with forty five percent efficiency, and you can have a bandwidth typically of thirty megahertz and the pulse durations of up to seven microseconds. Now here's the Millstone Hill uh, range uh, radar. It, uh, it was designed in the 1960s and uh, an earlier version of it was the first uh, radar to detect uh, Sputnik 1 as it passed over the United States. This device uses two klystrons. Uh, it's an L-band and it has a bandwidth of 8 megahertz, uh, average power of 120 kilowatts. Think of that. An eighth of a megawatt. The, the pulse width is a millisecond. Beam width of 0.6 degrees. And that diameter is um, 84 feet. And this was designed, the Alban version was designed in the early 1960s. There was, I believe, a UHF version that uh, existed before it was upgraded. Now here is the inside of what this thing looks like, which is amazing. Uh, when you've got something that's that kind of power, it needs 600 watts of input power, you've got a one kilowatt peak power solid state intermediate power amplifier, which is solid state, right in there. And in this room are the two um, tubes, the two klystrons. And here we have a spare tube outside. And you can see the, the piping here. Um, it's got uh, water coolant at 70 gallons per minute to cool the excess heat, which is the inefficiency uh, if, if, if 35 to 40 percent of, of that output power it goes out, you're going to have to dissipate an enormous amount of heat in each tube. And you can see those uh, coolant right there and there. And, uh, and the, you can see the other connections. Each one weighs 600 pounds. Now this view graph was, was put together, uh, I'd say, five years ago. Uh, by a colleague at the lab, and and, and it was four thousand four hundred thousand uh, dollars if you wanted to buy one from Varian, and I'm I'm sure you know at inflation, uh, the two those tubes now are up around at least six hundred thousand. It's seven feet tall, a foot in diameter, six hundred pounds, and here again are its properties as it's used in the the Millstone Hill radar. And in this transmit room, this is big time radar going out to that 200 foot dish. Okay, now we go to another class uh, using another techniques, and this is for high power amplification, and this is called a traveling wave tube. Here again, we have a heater and a cathode, and uh, the uh, electron beams emitted from the cathode. You have a, a, a gun anode, which the electron beam heads down here on a path, and then it interacts in a helical region. And you have down at this point RF in and RF out. And I'm going to show you in a minute uh, how that works, I believe. These are very expensive, easily a half a, half a million a, a piece. They're capable of wide bandwidth. And towards the end, I'm going to show you a comparison of the different kinds of systems. 
It's similar to the klystron, and it's a linear beam tube. And the interaction of the RF field and the electron beam over the length of the tube, uh, the RF wave mixes with that electron beam and transfers DC energy, causing the electron beam to increase the energy of the RF wave, causing the wave to be amplified. And uh, that, that's as much as how they work I'm going to go into you with. There's a little bit more. It's an awful lot in this. Uh, there's so many transmitter technologies to go into each one into gory detail. You know, you have to cut the bar somewhere. And anyway, uh, there are different designs of traveling wave tubes. The ones I'm sh showing you now are called coupled cavity traveling wave tubes and evolution and all that. Because I, I, I want to show you pictures of how these are. I, here's a, an S-band um, coupled cavity traveling wave tube. You know, you can pick one up for, you know, $400,000 from uh, um, CPI out in the West Coast. And uh, just you can look it up on a web, see the catalog, call them up how much. And uh, here are four of them in parallel in an S-band transmitter. And again, what you see is, you know, high voltage going in and RF going out. The peak power, and it, it has an 8% duty cycle, uh, over four orders of magnitude gain. Uh, and, and it's got a bandwidth of 400 megahertz for this, for this one. Now, when we go to the a, a real granddaddy we've got here, and, and excuse me, you've got these tubes going up. Where the uh, the cooling, which is obviously enormous for 160 kilowatts, um, these are cooled, um, I believe, by ethylene glycol. And here's an X-band traveling uh, coupled cavity traveling wave tube, and its center frequency is in the X-band region. It's got a gigahertz of bandwidth, 35 percent duty cycle that this tube is run at. And uh, it's got 50 dB of gain. That's magnificent. You know, you can, you can reach out and touch something. And uh, the, hay, the haystack radar at uh, Millstone Hill in Westwood, Massachusetts, uses the, right, uh, this, this kind of a tube. It has for, for decades uh, in its uh, transmitted. Next, I'm going to talk about cross-field amplifiers. Uh, this is a simplified representation which I put together um, with Adobe Illustrator. It's based on a figure in Merrill Skolnick's book. It resembles a magnetron, which I'm going to talk about in the next section in about four view graphs. And uh, it, it's, I'd say, a follow-on to the magnetron. It's capable of, ho of co high coherent power uh, within a pulse and good efficiency and wide bandwidth but it's got relatively low gain lately some uh, advanced versions of uh, a high, they call them high gain CFAs uh, will go up to th uh, 20 30 DB of gain and they're generally noisier and less stable than some of the other systems but in the right uh, gain to do what you want to do and uh, the way they work is you have RF come in and you have a crossed electric field. Here, here is the anode and uh, these anodes and, uh, and here's a cathode. There's also a control electrode to control uh, the coupling as you can see in this pattern. You put in low power and it th does an interaction with a very high power voltage source, a drop from many kilowatts or to zero, and it goes across that, and it couples in energy from that po input DC power, and it gets mixed in and modulated so that it has the, the waveform of the RF pulse. Now here we have electrons emitted from the cylindric a cylindrical cathode, this is. Electrons are emitted, and under the action of crossed electromagnetic fields, 
the electrons form rotating bunches. So if we have the electric field going this way, you've got a magnetic field in, in the opposite direction. And the bunches of, of electrons drift in phase with the RF signal and transfer their DC energy to the RF wave to produce amplification at this output. And here's a picture of a, uh, a cross-field amplifier. This one again from CPI. And you can see the inputs and the outputs, where the voltage would come in. And you can see the magnet right here. Which you can have, and in, in this little area in here is the interaction area of the cross-field amplifier. This particular one is at X-band. It, out, it puts out uh, a little less than a uh, megawatt, but it's got a very small duty cycle, uh, a tenth of a percent, a pulse width of 0.83 microseconds, and it's liquid cooled. They all need that cooling to dissipate the significant power that these systems have. Now let's look and um, compare the of systems. We've got klystrons, and, and in voltage, uh, they work uh, pre pretty darn well. They, they can go up to, to high voltages. Uh, the cross-field amplifier requires less voltage input. The gains on the klystron and TWTs is significantly more than the gains on the cross-field amplifier. Uh, you get more bandwidth from a traveling wave tube. Uh, the X-rays are severe, but lead is reliable and take care of it. And with the traveling wave tubes and the klystrons, same with uh, the TWTs. And there's no problem for the cross-field amplifier. Uh, the basic efficiencies of these tubes um, with uh, and without cross uh, depressed collectors are these as follows. And you can see you can get pretty good efficiencies. Um, the klystrons require, an ion pump is required, the vacuum system with, with larger klystrons and with larger TWTs, and it's self, cross-field uh, amplifiers self-pumping, and the weights of these two are very large compared to the CFA, the sizes are much larger, the cost of a klystron that we call medium, they're high for the TWTs, and medium for the cross-field amplifiers, and uh, the spurious noise is very small with the uh, klystrons and traveling wave tubes. And the usable dynamic range uh, is, is very high with the first two and just a few dB from pulse to pulse with the cross-field amplifier. The region, reason is, is uh, well, I'll put a hold on that for a minute. Uh, now, now let's move on to the next piece and we're going to take a break here.